Good morning, everyone. If everybody could find a seat. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. If everybody could find a seat, that would be great. We're going to uh, uh, welcome to Community Fellowship Baptist Church. Um, If I could ask everybody to stand, we are going to start with our beautiful song this morning, We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise to the house of the Lord, and we offer up to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy, and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy please have a seat good morning, good morning. this nice rainy day uh, I have some announcements. Somebody's told me to do them. No, I love doing them. So, so we have Tuesday nights. Why? Chris. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Tuesday nights we have the Bible study at 7 o'clock, I think, right? Yep, okay. So we have that going on Tuesday nights. Um, we're going to pray for Wes. We're going to pray for Israel. We're going to pray for Gail McCaskey for her health. Um, there's lots to pray for. Uh, so let's get down and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are, that you are the Christ, that you are our God, and that you're the one that deserves all the glory and all the praise. Father, we do pray for Wes, that you would continue to strengthen him, that he would just um, not be tired all the time or fatigued. Father, that you would watch over the family as well. Father, we pray for Gail McCaskey as she has health problems. We just pray that you would touch her body and help, and help her to get stronger. Father, we also pray for Ed as he um, is with her. We just pray that you would give him the wisdom as well to, to take care of his wife. And Lord, we just pray for Israel. Father, there's so much going on over there. Lord, we pray for the peace for Israel. We know this is nothing new to you. Um, but, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to watch over that country. And, Lord, I'm just going uh, to thank you so much for who you are, that you are the Christ again, and that you never leave us nor forsake us. Father, we pray for Scott this morning as he preaches the word. We just pray that you would have your Holy Spirit speak through him, and that we would have our spirit in us would be able to listen clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. So I have a, a little letter here that somebody gave me some from, uh, it says, P.S., just a reminder, we need to be careful about posting things on the internet. So, okay. I'll let the worship team continue. I'm going to ask you guys all to stand, uh, and we're going to do a reading from Psalms 108, verse 1 to 5. My heart is steadfast, O God. 
I will sing and make melody with all my being. Awake, O harp and lyre, I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praise to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. We're going to sing as the deer. As we go into the next song, Fairest Lord Jesus, let's praise him and give him thanks for everything that he has done for us.
please have a seat. Our next song is Freely, Freely. You know, as everything that uh, we're going through as the world is, is having trials and, and we are in a free country that we can, you know, enjoy things and, you know, and we can come to church and worship the Lord. So as we sing this song, rejoice, rejoice that we can. sin in Jesus name I've been born again in Jesus name and in Jesus name I come to you to share his love as he told me to any kids that want to go down to Sunday school or grown-ups, it's up to you. <laughs> you come down and we'll pray for you. Let's pray anyways for, for if they do to go down. <laughs> you can come down if you want. It's fine. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for these children. Lord, they're your children. You gave them to us and help us to use them for your glory. Help them to show who Christ is that Christ will be glorified. We pray for the teachers that will be teaching them, that you will give them wisdom as well. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And Doug will come up and preach now. It's on. Thank you. Okay. Is that on? Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, it's not as loud up here as it was last week. So if I start yelling, let me know, okay? I'm going to go to John chapter 2 today. And a familiar passage, but something I've never heard preached on before. <clears throat> John chapter 2. And just a few things to say first. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Scott. Hi. Some of you haven't seen me before. Thanks for being here today. Um, I was up last week, and we are here um, in August. I just want to thank you guys for scheduling me to visit to preach this week and last week, and not in the middle of the winter. 
because we would have driven up here anyways, probably today and last Sunday, you know, just to, to enjoy the loop and drive through and try to see a moose and all that stuff that you do up here this, this time of year. So just want to thank you for having us. It's been a blessing. <clears throat> In the middle of the winter? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, let's pray. No, just kidding. Um, okay, so uh, a few things to say. This, this week at work, um, I hired a man named Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. So uh, I work for a global manufacturing company, and we have a, a new plant opening in Mexico. And so the gentleman that's going to work for me down there, his name is Jesus Emmanuel, like double dip, like really saw that resume, and I was like, I don't even need to re read the rest. That's perfect. <laughs> this is the guy. I want to meet his mom and ask her, what were you thinking, you know, with, you know, Jesus Emmanuel? You know, do you know what you've done? Um, so anyways, he's a good guy. So I, I'm talking to the upper management with this resume. I'm saying, well, this is the guy I'd like to hire. And they know I'm a Christian. I, I live a Christian conversation in my workplace, and they know I preach sometimes, and they, they make jokes about stuff like this all the time. And, and uh, I said, okay, so this is the guy I'd like to hire. And they, you know, they looked at me, and I, and I was like, read the resume. You know, it's a good resume. We interviewed him. And, and uh, she, my, my boss said, She's reading the resume, and she says, is there anything in the resume about turning water to wine? Because it's been a bad week around here. And I said, no, there is nothing in his resume. But, you know, she makes a lot of bad jokes like that. And, uh, but, you know, everybody knows this story. Everybody, you know, anybody who's heard of Jesus, you know, it's sort of like, you know, they, they know the legend, right? They, they know, it's like uh, if you've heard of Superman, you know, you know things about Superman. Right? What do you know? Uh, the tights, which is weird. Um, he can fly. He's strong. Laser eyes. If you really get into it, some other fun stuff as well. Um, or maybe another superhero or, or, or you know, X-Man, you know, like, like Wolverine. Okay? So Wolverine, he, he can heal. He lives really long. He's got, you know, cool claws, and that's Wolverine. And, th and the way the world looks at Jesus it, it is like the legend, you know? Well, what can Jesus do, you know? We can turn water to wine and uh, walk on water, and uh, he's really hard to kill, you know? And, and so um, that's the way the world looks at this, when, they, when you talk about the water turned to wine. And a lot of us look at this story, too, and we just, oh, yeah, I know that story, and skip by it. And I've always wondered, why is this in this spot in the book of John? Do you ever, you read in the book of John, and you kind of just glaze right over and skip over this. You've got John 1, which is so packed you know, with, with the deity of Christ and, and uh, all, the, all the beginning of the church and God's, you know, son starts to call people unto him and the baptism. And, and then you've got John chapter 3 there. And John chapter 3 might be the most preached chapter in the, in the history of Christianity. And, and, you know, between what Jesus preaches to Nicodemus and what John the Baptist preaches to basically everybody in John chapter 3, you know, you have everything. But right between there, you have this you know, neat miracle, this neat story, and um, I've always wondered, why is this here? But the miracles of John's gospel are something more. John records seven specific miracles, and they're all in there for a, a specific reason, and they come with a lesson. They come with, usually followed up with a sermon, an explanation, all of them, except this one. This one just kind of stands alone. It's just, a, it's just a, a start to miracles, and it almost is there speaking for itself. It does show a few things. It shows, you know, yes, it shows Christ has the power over physical creation, you know, um, and, he, and he shows that all through his ministry. Some people say it, it you know, when it says it manifests forth his glory, we'll read it in a minute, it's to, it shows the deity of Christ, but really, you know, even though nobody else ever turned water to wine, the only thing we have close really is Moses turning a river to blood, you know, um, but nobody really turned water to wine. It's, it's a unique miracle for Christ, but it doesn't really show that he's God, you know, calling down fire from heaven and show Elijah was God. But, you know, why is this miracle here? What does it mean when it says manifest, manifest forth his glory? And so, it, you know, it shows that Jesus has power over creation, but we are also part of creation. Let's read John chapter 2 and, uh, and the story here. 
And the third day, uh, there was a marriage in, in uh, Cana of Galilee. Now, that's important because if you go back to John chapter 1, it's, it's Jesus calling a bunch of his disciples together, and he's got a few of them now, and they're following with him. And, it, and it, it's, there's some very specific details in this chapter. You go back and read them all later. But it, it gives specific timing and numbers and details. It's not like, and this came to pass, and we went on to this city, and this came to pass, and it doesn't give you a timeline. It's saying, when these disciples had just started following Jesus, in fact, just three days after the events of John chapter 1, you come down to, to the marriage of the Canaan, uh, at Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples. And so this must have been someone close to the mother of Jesus because she seemed to have some pull. And, and even these people that Jesus had called to come with him, um, were invited to the marriage. And when they, they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. And Jesus says a, an interesting thing here, which kind of, I think, reveals, and it's funny that brother asked me this earlier, it kind of reveals a little bit the relationship between Jesus' mother and Jesus before he manifests his glory to the world. She knew who he was all along. She saw him learn to, to speak and his vocabulary. She would have seen him in the temple at 12 years old, a few years before this, you know, confounding the Sanhedrin members, you know, and, and knowing things he shouldn't have known. And, and she sends him to school and it's all straight A's, you know. Like all the way along, she knew who this guy was. And so when they run out of wine, she says, oh, Jesus, can you help them? They've run out of wine. And he says, mom, come on. I can't do this in front of people, you know? What, my, my, my hour is not come yet, he says. It, that's not the time for me to be, you know, God in flesh yet, basically is what he's saying to his mother. So she says, she says, they have no wine. And he says to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. Wow, that's some good advice for life right there. Good advice from mother, the, the mother of Christ. Whatsoever Christ says unto you, do it. And that's really the theme of this chapter. And so his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. And that's about 80 to 100 liters. But he, it specifically gives like different numbers. So these weren't like all exactly the same. These were around 80 to 100 liters each in these, in these water pots, okay? Probably like um, if, if you have a, a rain catch beside your drain, it's probably the same size as a, a barrel like that. And Jesus said unto them, fill the, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And he said unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not from where it was, but the, the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning to set forth good wine, and when the men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you've kept the good wine until the end. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and, and manifest forth his glory. And notice, and his disciples believed on him. Let's pray. Lord God, as we take this time to study this important miracle and what it has to say to us today, Lord, I pray that people would be attentive, that you'd speak to our hearts, and Lord, that you would energize our belief in your ability to use us. In Jesus' name, amen. We have, we have in, in John chapter 2 some interesting details about this miracle. Now, we could have just, it could have been a one verse miracle. There's some of those in the New Testament. It could have been, and Jesus went down to a marriage, and there they were out of wine. He turned water to wine, and it was the best wine they had ever had, and his disciples believed on him. And on we go on to John chapter 3. You know, a little spot, but there's so many details in here where John gets numbers and timing and specific phrases which match up with Scripture from other parts of the New Testament. Let's look at some of them. First, we see we have pre-selected vessels. They had set there six water pots, uh, uh, um, 
they had set there six water pots after the purifying the manner, manner of the purifying the Jews. So they, they were specifically set aside, you know, not for the wedding, not for anything else. We've got to keep these aside for water. And there were specific rules back then. It was, it was much dirtier, you know. We're, we wash our hands after we use the washer, and we have indoor plumbing, you know. Uh, when we do the dishes, we dry them, everything is squeaky clean again, and we pull a dish out, and it's like brand new. So that's the way that they had cleaned these vessels. Really, any vessel could be used for anything. You could, you could use, a, you know, those big Rubbermaid garbage, garbage cans. You could use that for water. You could use it as a giant cooler with ice in it. You could use it as a garbage can. You could use it to collect leaves. You know, the vessel could be for all kinds of things, but they had set these aside specifically for this use. These were pre-selected vessels, and the Lord knew they were there. I have a question, though. Why not seven or three or 12 water pots? Anybody who's, who reads the Bible and studies the Bible, when Jesus does things, when the Lord does things specifically, it's usually manifesting his glory with specific numbers, his numbers. But in this case, John doesn't just say, and there were some water pots there. He says specifically there's six water pots. What does that have to do with anything? Why even record that detail? Well, in the Bible, the number of six, on the sixth day, God created man. The number six is the number of mankind. That detail is there to let us know this is for us. This entire passage has to do with mankind. And it says there were six water pots and, and a numerology that has to do with mankind or the number of man. And so God calls and God chooses how and who he uses. God chooses how and God chooses who and God chooses when he uses specifically. In Acts chapter 9, let me see if I got my right marker here. I do. In Acts chapter 9. Um, it, in Acts chapter 8, Paul the Apostle, who was Saul, came, comes through and stirs up the church. And imagine, how many seats are in here? About 100? 120 maybe? Okay, so a room almost exactly like this. In the top of a house, there was about 120 people in, in the church when Pentecost started, right? They had a church much like the size of this. And, and, uh, and exploded into a huge, massive amount of people outside of the temple being fed by, you know, those 120 people. And, and so they, uh, they had this massive explosion in the church, and all the Pharisees were after them, right? And Paul, who was Saul, was, was after them and was putting some of them in prison and was going after the main guys that had started it all and was driving all these people that had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost out of the city, and they, they all were dispersed. And so when, when he had he'd succeeded at getting a lot of them to go home from Jer Jerusalem that were there for Pentecost, then he goes after them to Syria, right? And so he's on the, the path to Damascus, and the Lord miraculously saves Paul, right? And, he's, and he says, uh, it's hard for you to, you know, to, to fight against me and, and, and saves him. We, we don't, that's not the point. But he specifically went after Paul the way that Paul had specifically gone after the church. It's kind of funny. So when, uh, when the Lord is, is uh, telling, I think it's Annas, to go and baptize Paul and, and speak to him um, mm -hmm. about uh, um, his conversion, we come down to verse 15. And, uh, and he's talking to the Lord. And the Lord says un, unto, uh, unto Annas, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, that's Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me, notice the word vessel, unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Even though Paul was who Paul was, God had a specific ministry that needed to be done in the first century, and he was the perfect guy for it. And so God chose Paul, that chosen vessel that was prepared for a specific use, and he went after him, and he said, don't worry, I've got a plan for this guy's life. And so 
If you are so blessed in your life to be chosen by God, to do a ministry, don't miss out on what God wants you to do. But secondly, in chapter, in chapter 2 of the book of John, we have purified vessels. They were purified after the manner of the Jews. And the Jews had some of the best cleanliness laws and, and traditions of anyone in the world. They were very clean. They cleaned their clothes. They wouldn't touch a dead body. They were purified specifically, um, these vessels, for any use. And so it says uh, in, in um, <clears throat> the same verse there, um, that there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing, you know, uh, about 80 or 100 liters. And so um, they were set apart for a specific use. They were set apart for a specific use. You know, holiness is required in ministry. When God calls you to do a job, a connection with God is required. We can't just do things without having holiness and a connection with God. In, in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says this. In verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I don't know what the Lord wants to use you for, but I know that holiness prepares you to be used for anything. One thing about Paul, Saul, one thing about him, you wouldn't catch him at the bar or at the strip club or doing some evil thing with his life. He did follow the Old Testament law to the letter. He was holy in his mind before God. Now, we don't always know all of what's right and wrong. We're finite in our knowledge, but what we do know is right and wrong. We should definitely follow that. And our holiness before our God, our purity before our God, makes us ready in attitude and makes us trustworthy in faith. So there were pre-selected -pre vessels, and they were pure vessels, but notice also they were prepared vessels. They were, they were prepared vessels. If there were 12 actual, if there were 12 vessels there, or if there were 20 vessels there, and he said, fill all of them with water, do you think he would have only turned six of them to wine? If, if, if at Pentecost, when there was 120 people in the church, if there was 500 people in the church, do you think they all would have been filled with the Holy Spirit or just 120? They got what they prepared for. It just so happens that if there were more people available, there would be more work that got done. Now, wine in the Bible is a, is a, is a picture of the grace of God. It's a picture of the blessing of God. When it talks about wine in the Old Testament, it talks about um, uh, um, the fruit of the vine, the blessing of the land. You know, there's much more blessing to be had if there are more vessels prepared to do the work of the Lord. Sure, six was enough for that wedding. They were pretty big vessels, I guess. But it could have been so much more. Sometimes preparation feels like over-preparation. You know, sometimes the Lord is getting us ready to be used in a way that we don't like, you know. Um, there's not, not many teenagers in here, but when I was a teenager, I, I, I knew the Bible a little bit, and I wanted the Lord to use me, 
And I thought, well, now I'm 17, so I can do everything, you know? Not only do I know everything, but I can do everything everybody else can do, and the Lord could just use me right now, you know, David and Goliath style. I get out in the water and walk with Jesus. You know, whatever you need, shadow behind me, just lay guys down on the street, you know? But, but God's timing and our timing are usually quite different. The preparation of the Lord, he has in mind the right timing. After Jesus went up and ascended into heaven and, the, and the, the, the church met for, I think it was probably eight or ten days, something like that, before Pentecost, maybe just seven days, I don't know, something like that. It's pretty detailed numbers there. But it was a few days. They were meeting up there, and that's when the Lord speaks to Peter and says, you need to pick somebody to take Judas's place, and all those things happen in Acts chapter 1. When, when all that's happening, the Lord's preparing the church. They have no idea what Pentecost is going to be. They have no idea they're going to go and preach. They had plans to get up that morning and go into church and pray like they did the day before. But the Lord had prepared them to do something they could never have seen. Sometimes preparation seems like over-preparation. But really, it's the refiner's fire that makes the most valuable success. You know, Moses spent 40 years, maybe he spent 80 years being prepared for the work that God had for him to do. Wouldn't you spend 80 years preparing to be the guy that stepped into the Red Sea and parted the Red Sea for the Lord? Sometimes preparation seems long, and it seems like it's a long wait. You know, who was Elijah for the, for, for the first part of his life? We have no idea who he is, where he came from, prepared all that time, and the Lord called him and said, go preach to Ahab, and then used him in an amazing, miraculous way that he never could have imagined. Joseph spent 17 years being prepared to save the world through his abilities that God gave him, through the miracles that God did. And Jesus spent three years, the best possible teacher, with eyewitness miracles, Literally, God in flesh took three years to train his 12 disciples to be ready. Sometimes things take a while to prepare. You might not be ready overnight for the miraculous power of God to do something great with you. Wait. Let the Lord prepare you. You know, err on the side of over-prepared, overly pure, not just good enough, not just ready enough. Let the Lord prepare you for something amazing. And so we have prepared vessels. But fourthly, we have perfectly filled vessels. Okay, so you're supposed to, when you preach a sermon, you're supposed to alliterate, okay? I know it doesn't matter to you guys, but it matters to me. So you're supposed to use the same starting to each word. I couldn't think of a word to fill something that starts with a P. If any of you can, you come and let me know afterwards. But I do know that they filled them to the brim. So I went with perfectly filled, okay? So they are perfectly filled to the brim. Look what Jesus says. He says, fill the water pots with water. He doesn't say, okay, put some water in those. Right? He says, fill the water pots with water. So the servants, these were some good servants, I'll have to say. They filled them right to the brim, right to the top. They filled them perfectly. And so we have perfectly filled vessels. Jesus said, fill them, and they filled them to the brim. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, let me read it to you just to make sure I get what it actually says. Right on for you. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, it says, ironically, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with with the Spirit. And so we are to be filled to the brim. What's filling your life today? Keeping you, limiting you from how much God would use you. If there had have been some other things in the vessels that they may perhaps have not have seen unless they look closely, and they had poured the water in, it may, have, it may have thought they would have got 80 to 100 liters, but they might have only got 20 of the blessing of God. What's in your life today limiting you from how much God could use you? How much 
of a blessing you could be. How much is enough for you? Maybe we, may, may, may we be like Peter. Remember when Jesus went and, he, and, and they didn't know what he was doing and he washed their feet, right? And he washed, he, he washed them and he said, you're not washing my feet, Peter. And Jesus said, listen, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. This is important. Let me do what I'm doing. And Peter said, what? Okay, well, if this has to do with me having part with you, then wash me all over. Clean all over. I'll, I'll take all of it. He says, not just my feet, do my hands, do my head. I, you know, smelly fisherman probably needed it. He said, wash me all over that I could have a part in your blessing. Sometimes to see the truly miraculous happen in our lives, we need to trim out and leave space to be filled with the miraculous power of God rather than the vain temporal things around us. And so we have perfectly filled vessels. Notice also, though, we have a presented blessing. In verse 8 it says, And he said unto them, this is Jesus, says unto them, Okay, now, now that you've filled them, draw out and give to the governor of the feast. Uh, we work for him. <laughs> I just poured water into there. You want me to take that water and you want me to give it to the governor of the feast. Yeah, it's ready. And so he said unto them, draw out now and, and take it to him and bear it to him. And they did. They had no idea what was going to happen, but they obeyed. And as they pulled up that vessel, huh, it's red. I'm assuming red, you know, could have been white. Probably would have made it a little bit easier <laughs> to, a little more faith if it was white, I guess. And they take it to the governor of the feast, right? When the Lord said unto them, take the blessing and give it to others, they, immedi they immediately obeyed him. They immediately shared that as he told them to. When Jesus said, now go share that with others, they did. When Jesus says unto you, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Hey, go and preach. The Lord's done something miraculous in your life. He's given you the miracle of salvation in your life. What about the guy that you work with? What about the, the lady that you see all the time? What about the person you're ministering to? They need the gospel too. Hey, take that blessing and bear it to them. That's what this is all about, this entire story. And I think why John went back and recorded it this way. Jesus says in, in, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He gave them the secret, the whole reason he was here. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then in John chapter 20, and verse 21, he says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. This is all about a rescue operation. It's good to come to church and enjoy each other and hear the word and sing to God and go and spend some time with God and have our prayers answered and enjoy the blessing of God in our life. That's what we're meant to do. That's what God meant for us to do as a church. But he also meant for us to be the servants of the Lord that take his blessing and give it to people who are not expecting it and just wait till you see how shocked they are with how good it is. Wow, that is the best thing I have ever heard. You mean that all I have to do is trust Jesus Christ as my Savior? I don't have to give money to a priest. I don't have to show up for things. I just need to go humbly before my God and ask him for salvation. He's already given it to me. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to mix it. None of that. No, here, just take it and drink it. Come and dine. It is free. That is the best gospel that it could be. And the Lord says, hey, bear it to others. Are you manifesting forth the glory of God to those around you? I mean, those guys could have just got bottles and started balling it up. Hey, we're going to start our own company, you know. It's all ours. Look at all the blessing the Lord did for us today. No, the point is to show the glory of God to others. And God has something miraculous to do with you. He 
You see, just like those vessels, we are all just slightly different. Our circumstances are all a little bit different. We have no uh, uh, exact path. The Lord knows what he could do with you. And just like he knew that crazy loudmouth fisherman would be willing to stand up at Pentecost and 3,000 people could be saved. He saw that possibility. And just like he knew that Paul, the evil guy who everybody was afraid of and hid when he came walking by, I hope he doesn't know that I'm there, just like he knew he could take that guy and send him to the Gentiles, get him beat up a little bit, and have him live probably a pretty tough life for all that he'd done. I think it was probably worthy. And, and if he sent that guy to Iconium, Iconium would be saved. And if he sent that guy to Lystra, Lystra would be saved. He knew that vessel was perfect for that job. God has a perfect job for you with what you have. All around you, God has opportunities for you to manifest his glory in the world. I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for them that love him. Do you think Peter imagined Pentecost could ever happen? Nobody thought Pentecost could happen. I can't even believe Pentecost happens sometimes. Have you ever tried to witness to a Jew? Can you imagine? Like, it's almost a surety of death getting up and preaching that that day. Like, they just killed Jesus a few weeks before. It's almost a good thing he didn't understand as much as he did. <laughs> no, the Holy Spirit of God knew exactly what to do with him. Do you think Paul had any idea what was going to happen when he was singing in, a, in, a, in the Philippi jail? Do you think he thought the jailer who just beat him was going to trust Christ? Do you think there was going to be an earthquake and all the doors were going to fall off in the jail? We have no idea what God could do. But I do know that if we're ready to be used, God could use us. Do you have any idea what God has planned in your life? You know, if you're a chosen, pure, prepared, filled vessel, God can use you to miraculously manifest himself to those around you. A story and then I'm, I'm done. When I, was, when I was younger, I was very enthusiastic about witnessing for the Lord. And I was in a church that was in Toronto, and we would go out weekly downtown Toronto and, and give out the gospel to people. And that was terrifying sometimes, to be totally honest with you. Go to some apartment buildings and that. But it became kind of just like, I don't know why I'm here, so I'll just give the gospel to people. It didn't matter where we went. We saw people miraculously saved all the time, and it just became our, our church culture almost to just give out the gospel to everyone. People would go on the bus to church, win somebody to the Lord, and then they would come out to church. I, I know somebody that we've known for many years, our entire, in our, our entire marriage, the only reason she came out to church and trusted the Lord was because uh, a soul winner was sitting on the bus beside her and said, hey, where are you going tonight? Oh, um, I'm on my way to go grocery shopping. Oh, where are you going? I'm going to church. Oh, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to this little uh, church. We rent uh, another place over in Scarborough. Oh, there's a church there? Yeah. Do you want to come? Okay. And perfect stranger got saved that day. So when I was, when I was a teenager, you hear examples like that. Well, maybe God can use me, right? So I give out gospel to everybody, and I saw lots of people get saved, usually teenagers. It's kind of, you know, when you, I mean, I think older folks probably thought I was, you know, a little crazy. But I would I'd give the gospel to them anyways. So I was sitting waiting one day um, in a parking lot. My mom and my sister had gone into an orthodontist. And I was just sitting in a parking lot. It was in Newmarket. If anybody of you know, any of you know Newmarket, in the older part of town on Mulock, there's a, there's a pretty big commercial building there, a big parking lot across the road on Mulock there. There's a whole bunch of old big houses. One of these houses was having a party in the middle of the day. Whole bunch of teenagers which should have been in school. By the way, I should have been in school, but I was homeschooled. So they are, they're all, there's this big party, this big speakers on the front porch. And it's one of those houses that had a huge big por front porch, big stairs up and all that. Big party going on. And there I am sitting there with my hand on a hundred pack of gospel tracks. 
and nothing to do for 45 minutes. So I was like, hey, why not? So I went across the road and started giving out gospel tracts to everybody and telling them about Jesus. And this authoritative voice from the porch said, hey, what are you doing? Get out of here. I was like, oh, hey, my name's Scott. What's your name? Step up on the porch. No, we don't want any. Get lost. I'm serious, he says. And I was like, got it. I'd given away about 20. Back to the car. She kind of sneaked to the car so he doesn't know which one I got in. Back to the car. Prayed for him. He did tell me his name was Jesse. He answered me. He said, my name's Jesse. Now get lost. Something like that. I was like, okay. He was a little bit older than me, probably 18, 19, something like that. You could tell he was still a youth, but he's older than I was. So I prayed for him, moved on with my life a few months later. Now, I lived in Markham, on the east end of Markham, on a street called Lindy's Farm. It's a bunch of um, little townhouses, very little townhouses, and they had about, you know, 20 by 6 front yards. Some of them were connected, and a very small spot. And so, um, and right behind there was the Shoppers Drug Mart. And they had a bakery there. And so being a 16-year-old, every day I had to go to the bakery, buy fresh bagels, eat them all. So that's what I did. So ride down. And of course, being 16, I had no concern for running over other people's front yards with my bike. So down I go to the, to the plaza. Back I come, ride right across the front yard of that guy onto my front yard. And somebody on the front porch says, hey, why are you riding your bike across my front yard? And I was like, I recognize that tone. <laughs> Jesse? And you've never seen a person go so white in their life and so scared to death as Jesse. Sitting on the front porch, smoking, with a beer. I have no idea how old he is. Sitting there in the front porch and just like, I said, hey man, you're my next door neighbor. You guys just moved in, eh? So that day, Jesse trusted Christ. I told him that I had gone back to my car and prayed for him. And he asked Jesus Christ to be his savior. Some bagel trip a few weeks later, I was on my way to the convenience store there and the, the bakery and all that, and I parked my bike out, and I come out with my bagels, and there's Jesse walking um, it's sort of like a plaza that's kind of got a hallway between stores. It's indoor, but not out, not indoor. And so I rode my bike in there and parked, and, and, and there's Jesse coming, walking down the aisle with his girlfriend. And he said, hey, Scott, you've got to tell my girlfriend about Jesus. She's Jewish. And I was like, oh, here we go. Led her to the Lord in five minutes. He had already led her to the Lord, probably. He told her what had happened. She trusts Jesus Christ as her Savior. I, I, shortly after that time, I tried to get him to come to church a little bit. Ended up he was living in a group home. And it was a group home that was beside me, which I didn't understand what that was at that time. And he moved. Sh shortly after that, he moved. He was gone. And, it, and the Lord put me beside a group home and I saw many teenagers saved in that group home. You have no idea what the Lord might use you for. It could be that one day in heaven you can sit down beside the guy that you led to the Lord in a miraculous way. And the two of you can share in a, in a forum like this. Let us tell you that day the Lord turned water to wine in our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that if there's somebody here today that hasn't trusted you as their Savior, I pray that you would convict them right now, Lord. You're true, you're holy, and you've given the gospel for free. And Lord, for those of us that are considering what you could do with us in our lives, I pray that we take this opportunity to come to you in prayer and pray Lord, please use me in a miraculous way. Amen. Amen. Blessing.
Thank you, Scott. That was a wonderful message. If I can ask everybody to stand, we are going to sing at Calvary. Years I spend in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned. Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. See, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my rapture soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. the true salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. I'd just like to encourage you to go before the Lord today and see what he has for you. It will be amazing. God has something special for each one of us today. May you find it, may you enjoy it. Blessings. <laughs>